HDMI left on, Your Honor. Good morning. I always start my closing arguments in the same way. And it's simply this. If any of the attorneys, either throughout the trial or during closings today, from either side, myself, Mr. Brown, or the defense, misstate a fact or evidence, you should go with your collective memories. You guys are the jury. We've sat with this case for months, had meetings about it, talked about it, read things about it, and sometimes, not intentionally, but sometimes people, you know, misremember something or think of one thing they read. So please use your collective memories as jurors to, to determine what you heard and what you saw. Additionally, it should be the written law that the judge just read and that you will get a copy of that should determine how you process and think of the law. For years, I've listened to attorneys where prosecutors have basically belittled the burden of proof and where the defense has built it up to be something that can never be overcome or could only be overcome by video. Neither of those things are true. You should look at the written law and follow the written law. Second thing I want to say is I want to apologize for all the graphic photos that you folks had to look at the last three weeks. I'm sorry I had to show them to you, but we had to. They were, crime, they were part of a crime, and because of the charges and what, what we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, it was necessary for you to look at some of those photos. I will promise, though, today I will not be showing you any those anymore. There will be none of those photos in my closing. So every case that comes in is kind of like a puzzle. You have to look at it, because obviously you weren't there. But you know, solving a case and thinking about whether or not a person is guilty or not guilty is like putting together a puzzle. And it's your job as the jury to put that puzzle together. But the question in this case, or why this case is kind of unique, is the person who committed the crime had eight days to spread the pieces of that puzzle all over the state of Wisconsin, or at least southern Wisconsin. Now, what are the pieces of those puzzle? They're evidence. What is evidence? It's what you saw in this courtroom and what you heard in this courtroom, testimony. People sitting on the witness stand and telling you what they knew. Before we start off going through that evidence, I want to remind you of the background of the events before July 1st of 2021. In June of 2021, Bart and Krista Halderson um, lived at 4595 Oak Spring Circle with their son, Chandler Halderson. And at that time in June, they thought that their son had an internship with American Family, although there was problems with the payment. He hadn't been, been working there about six, seven months, hadn't been paid yet. They thought their son was attending an ATC, that he had already earned a solar certificate there, and that he was enrolled in the IT program and was one class away from graduating. They also thought that he was going to soon be going to a job in Titusville, Florida at SpaceX. Now, things became, became a little suspicious to the father, Bart Halderson, who's an accountant. He's wondering, why is a Fortune 500 company not paying my son when he's working there? And for over a year, he was talking to various people at Madison College or MATC about why he hadn't gotten his son's transcripts, why they couldn't get a meeting, why the, he hadn't received a solar certificate. He had been emailing with these three people, Aaron Hoover, Daniel Spieth, and Alyssa Brandt, and been communicating with them. This all kind of comes to a crescendo or to a head the day before Bart is murdered. And on that day, he has a phone call with Omar Job. He starts off this phone call. You can just tell in his voice he's angry because he thinks this college has been giving him and his son the runaround for about a year. They're not doing their job. And so he's kind of aggressive at the beginning of this call. You don't really like him until you know the whole story. And he learns during this call 
that his son has never earned a solar certificate, that his son is not enrolled in the IT program, that his son owes the college over $1,000, and that Alyssa Brandt, Aaron Hoover, and Daniel Spieth have never worked for Madison College. You, we see, and that is the background that lead us into the events of July 1st, 2021. On that day, that day is started by Chandler messaging his girlfriend. 7.26 a.m., I hardly slept. 7.27 a.m. I don't know, stuff really hasn't been going well for me lately. So I'm trying to plan for the next thing to fuck me over. We know at 7.27 a.m. his mom leaves for work. She works customer service at Zimbrick. She heads to work. We then know at 7.51 a.m. Chandler messages his girlfriend. Yeah, I had a great future planned and it's falling apart. Now, what does he know at this point? His dad does send him a text message the day before saying, I spoke to Omar Job. I honestly don't know if that meant anything to Chandler or not. But things are coming to a crescendo. And what we do know is he texts his girlfriend at 1.04 p.m. I overheard that they may go to the cabin with their friends, and I don't know. But I don't know. We also know that on Bart's work calendar, he has a meeting with Chandler and MATC. I don't know if Bart confronted him the night before. I don't know if Bart was gonna see how long this ruse or how elaborate this ruse was gonna get. But this topic was going to be discussed and there would be a coming to terms. We know that at 2.10 p.m., Bart texts Chandler, I'm ready whenever you are. What happened next? Well, we have to look at the evidence. There's a spent shell casing in the basement of the home. There's a bullet fragment, noticeable, oops, sorry, noticeable reddish brown staining also test positive for Bart's DNA. That's the bullet that went through and through Bart. The spent casing. And that casing tested positive as being shot from the rifle that belonged to Chandler. We know that Chandler got this rifle about two weeks prior and it was found in the barn on Irwin Road. We know that he got it from his friend Smith and he was given a bunch of ammo. We also see evidence in the basement of a divot from Ricochet, a fresh divot. Also blood, a quadrillion times more likely to be Bart than any other unknown person more blood. And we know that Chandler texted his mom this. Dad's phone died. Text or call me. Remember, dad's phone had a, a charger right there on the desk. You can plug your phone in and within 10 seconds send a text message. I think here there's a half truth. Dad's dead. Dad died. Oh, and get me soda on your way home. I have an extra hour of work. We know Chandler didn't have a job. He's stalling. Get his mom to take more time. Okay, I can, she says, smiley face. We know that she returns to the house at 5, 12 p.m. We also know that her blood is found in the basement as well. And at 5, 11 p.m., 5.11 p.m., Chandler starts writing the following note. Weekend chores, H2O2 and lemon. So that's hydrogen peroxide, which cleans up blood, and lemon, which is a deodorizer. Door handles, move your shit upstairs, get a job. Interesting, if he would have just gotten a job, he wouldn't have had to do the prior three. 
and clean the floor. That came back in a search warrant for his Google account. We also know at 7.49 p.m., he's in the shower FaceTiming his girlfriend. So he cleans up. He then departs at 8.16 that night for Quit Trip. We see him there at the Quit Trip. There's the Vovo. There he is. He buys 20 pounds of ice. He arrives back home at 8.29 p.m. Then we know that somewhere between 8.30 and 9.30, the neighbor, Steve Greiber, smells a weird burning, a pungent burning that he describes like a pig roast. And you heard testimony from fire inspector Bill Boswell that unfortunately in his line of work, he's come across many burned bodies, human bodies, and that they do in fact smell like a pig roast. Moving on to Friday, July 2nd. We know throughout that night, and there's, I'm not re-showing this video, and, but there's hours of this video. We know that we see burning in the fireplace and the garage light go on and off. All throughout the night. There it is, almost 3 a.m. Until at one point it kind of crescendos and dies down. We also know, looking at the living room of the Halderson home, that right there by the fireplace is a measuring tape. Folks, he measured the parts of the body to see if they were small enough to fit into the fireplace. And a fan, add oxygen to that fire, make it burn a little bit hotter. We know that it burned hot enough that it damaged the fireplace. The door shattered and the paint is visibly peeling and bubbling. We also know that there's blood evidence. Evidence of cleanup from the luminol photos, as well as droplets of blood. We know that that blood test, that those stains test positive for blood, and that they test positive for Bart and Krista's DNA. There is also some DNA from Chandler. He did cut his foot. We're not disputing that. But he cut his foot in the process of dismembering and blowing and burning his parents, not from playing ball with the dogs. More blood. That's also dad. And of course, on top of this fireplace that then is made to look all pristine with papers that date to June 23rd, not in, the, not in the winter from when you would have last actually had a real fire, but from June 23rd, there's a piece of skull. And so Dr. Christina, Christina Figaro Soto gets involved in this case. And she finds bones. She finds lots of bones. They go into this ash trap. I had never even heard of an ash trap before. Clearly, neither had Mr. Halderson. But they find a total of 230 bone fragments. She's able to say 106 of them were substantial enough that she's able to say what they were, that they were human and what parts of the body they're from. 53 from the skull or cranium, 18 from the hands, 24 teeth, eight vertebrae, three long bones, either from arms or legs. There's also evidence in the garage. We have blood staining on shoes. That blood staining tests positive for both Bart and Krista and is identified as blood, not just touch DNA. More staining on the shoes, Bart. And in the shoes, they test the inside of the shoes as well to see whose shoes these belong to. They're Chandler's, they're his size, size 10 and a half. Oh, and he's wearing them right there. Those are the shoes he wore. In the garage, there's an ax found. And there's blood staining on this ax. It's positive for human blood on the hilt. It's positive for human blood on the head. On the head of the ax is both Bart and Krista's DNA. 
on the hilt is both Bart and Krista's DNA. And look at those numbers. A, a quadrillion times more likely to be those two than an unknown person. That's a thousand times the world's population. And on the handle, Bart and Krista's DNA as well. We know at 7.02 a.m. that morning, that's a Friday morning of a holiday weekend, okay? July 3rd, Friday morning, a 23-year-old at 7.02 a.m. gets up, drives to Fleet Farm. Again, wearing those shoes, he buys a tarp. There's that tarp, six by eight. That tarp is later found in a trash bin at the Earlwyn Road property out in the woods. He returns home at 7.31, and we see the following, throughout the day, we see the following text messages between him and his girlfriend. We're set for this. We just need ice. And now hydrogen peroxide, because I stepped on glass. Later, there's more talk, whether she will come or not. But if your mom has an extra bottle, that'd be great. And a Swiffer wet jet. Okay, I do kind of, and there's more talk about whether or not Cat will be there and what time, and Chandler responds, okay, I do kind of need the Swiffer and the peroxide and stuff. Oh, and remember ice. Didn't he just buy 20 pounds of ice less than 12 hours earlier? But he needs more ice. What does he need that ice for? Well, the fireplace broke. We know there's a freezer. He bought lots of ice. And that freezer tested positive for human blood. Parts of his mom and his dad were put in that freezer. We know that night on the second, one of Krista's coworkers, Daniel Kroninger, came to the house. He had heard that day that Krista no called and no showed for work, and that is not the Krista he knew. She had worked there for several years, had never done that before, just not the type of person she was. I mean, of course, I never met her, but she seems a little type A, like she liked things to be in order, liked things to be a certain way, and was responsible. So he comes over, and Chandler begins to tell the tale of, yeah, they went up to the cabin. They left this morning with some mystery couple. You know, she probably just forgot to take off, even though her boss testified that she would often take off a year in advance and get the dates right and had dates planned out in the future. But Daniel seems to be somewhat satisfied with that. Here's the problem. Krista's phone is responding to towers in her house. She didn't go anywhere. She never left that house. There are cameras on every side of that house. We know when Krista went in, and we never see her leave. This is not a whodunit, folks. That house is surrounded by cameras. We know who came and left. And we know that her phone was found in a shoe, hidden under a shelf, behind other shoes, wrapped in tin foil, wrapped in a paper towel. Dan leaves about 10 minutes later after talking with Chandler. And Kat arrives and spends the night. And they spend the night on this couch fort. You probably thought, why are they putting in evidence about that? Who cares where they slept? This is why it's important. A normal bed, a queen size, is about five feet wide. Two people can sleep there really comfortably and, for the most part, not disturb one another unless you're a rather light sleeper. But Chandler has a problem. He has body parts in the basement of his home, in the freezer. What if Kat gets a hankering for some ice cream and goes in there like she had before? He needs to be able to control her that night. He needs to be able to know if she wakes up and where she goes if she does. So he builds this, a thing that has walls where you really can't get in and out of it gracefully. It's his way to know where she's at. I'm not sure if his girlfriend realizes how lucky she actually is. Saturday, July 3rd, 2021. Cat leaves at 6.55 a.m. She has a job. 
And we know at 7.47 a.m., Chandler is once again up and leaving the house, headed for Roxbury. How do we know that he's headed for Roxbury? His Snapchat shows him there. Kat kind of keeps track of Chandler's location, and they snap each other all the time. She finds him there. His phone also puts him there. And he's quite close to where the remains were found. We also know that is an area he frequented. That's a picture of him about a year before, standing there with a knife. And that white tent in the background, that's where they found mom's legs. Dr. Rogalska performed the autopsy of the legs. And there's only certain things she can tell us from the limited amount of human body remaining that she was able to do an autopsy of. She can say that Krista Halderson was dismembered post-mortem, so after death. She also, looking at a totality of the circumstances, puts the cause of death as homicidal violence. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot tell you if Krista was shot, strangled, stabbed, or something else. I can't. What I can tell you is we have five bullets missing from a magazine, and we know that Bart Halderson was shot two or three times. So there are two missing bullets, but I don't know if she was shot. What I do know is she entered the house, and it was only Bart and Chandler there. No one else. She died of homicidal violence. Manner of death, homicide. And those are legal documents that the, the ME has to put these determinations on. We know that Chandler arrives back home at 9.31 a.m. Later that day, he goes to Dulce's house, and we, he returns at 3.07 p.m. And that night, though, we know he leaves his house at 10.08 p.m. And we know he goes up to Portage along the Wisconsin River from his house to Portage and back. He's up in the Portage area from at least 10.37 p.m. to 11.03 p.m. Portage is along the Wisconsin River. We tried to search that area. The Wisconsin River has a very strong current. People drown there every year, and we never find their bodies, and their bodies are whole. Um, they attempted a dive. It was unsafe. Um, we didn't find any evidence there. But I think in the totality of the circumstances, that wasn't a nighttime trip to go swimming. We know he returns at 11.30 p.m. And then we go on to July 4th. July 4th is actually the day that is the most eerie to me. Because it's like Chandra Halderson pushed pause on his crime and just lived a normal life for a day. On July 4th, he spends the day with his girlfriend and his girlfriend's family. He goes to the farm, uses the pool, eats dinner. They have some sort of barbecue. And he asks permission to return the next day and use the pool. On that day, he does do one thing concerning his crime. Oh, and then he goes to fireworks that night with, at Dan Croninger's house. He does send this text message that he, report, that he says, tells everyone is from his mom. And it is made from mom's phone that, again, is in the house, in shoes, hiding in the garage. Made it safely. Can't get anything through. And yes, it's packed. Going to White Lake today for the parade. We'll be home Monday night or, early or Tuesday early. Love you lots. Mom ended a lot of her text messages to Chandler. Love you lots. Couple problems with the text message. First, the parade was on Saturday, not Sunday. Second, the phone never leaves Windsor, Wisconsin. Monday, July 5th. We know that Kat had stayed over the night before, and she leaves at 747. We know that that day is supposedly Chandler's big doctor appointment at 2 p.m. 
We know that it's at a UW clinic on Park Street because there's conversation between Kat and Chandler about her potentially taking him, trying to get off of work, and you know she actually Googles the directions. Here's his text messages to her. Made it a bit ago and checked in. This is at 2.09. Just need you to know, because I have horrible reception. 2.22. No connection to even load Snapchat. 2.24. And no Wi-Fi. 2.24. What UW clinic doesn't have Wi-Fi? They took an x-ray and CT scan. Nothing bad on the x-ray. CT scan, hun. They haven't determined anything, but with my legs, like they were, and all, I gotta wait to hear what they determined. Chandler never went to any doctor's appointment. He's at home, sending these text messages to his girlfriend, keeping up his ruse. Nowhere close to Madison, certainly not on Park Street. He does leave the house, though, that day. At 4.30 p.m., he goes to the farm. We know about that. He leaves a voicemail for Cress, and then him and Cress end up having an interaction, and there's this whole conversation about using the pool. We also hear from both Cress and Dulce that they went by the pool, and there was no Chandler. So they take their little uh, lawnmower. What did Dulce say? Granny's on a lawnmower. Um, and they ride to where his car is, and the back is up, the trunk door, the hatch. And no Chandler, it's by the wood line. They see Chandler at some point kind of exit from the wood line. And it, indeed, his phone does have him there. And Cress is concerned enough she thinks something's happening. I don't think she thought this, but she thought something was happening. So she asks the deputies to come take a look out in the woods there. So Brent Baverstock comes. He sees turkey vultures. He knows what he's about to find. He probably thinks he's going to find a whole body, but he knows what he's about to find. And there was Bart Halderson's torso. Dr. Breslauer did the autopsy of Bart's torso. She said he had at least two gunshot wounds, possibly three. She couldn't tell because some of the deterioration of the muscle, whether or not it was like one wound tract or two. Um, so at least two, but maybe three. That he was shot in the back at least twice. That there was bullet material located in his body. And that one shot was a contact wound. The muzzle of the gun was touching his skin on the back. This wasn't a, oops, the gun went off. This is a, got you. You're dead. Cause of death, gunshot wounds. Manner of death, homicide. Can't shoot yourself in the back. So deputies begin to search this property. It's a vast property maybe about 45 acres, um, a lot of it's prairie, a lot of it's woods, but they find this oil drum that has this weird cutout. And so they look in there and they find tools. And those tools then are tested by the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. The all-way handsaw has human blood identified as Bart and Krista. The broken saw blade has blood, it's Bart's. The scissors has blood, Bart and Krista's. And again, look at those numbers, a thousand times the world's population. There's also some pruning shears. Again, tested positive for human blood, Bart and Krista. And the head had Bart. Some of these tools were then sent to Dr. Figueroa Soto. And she did a detailed analysis, and she sat and she talked a lot about, well, things I don't really understand. 
But here's the basics of what I understood and what her reports say, is that this always saw has a certain number of teeth per inch. This broken handsaw has a certain number of teeth per inch. She can look microscopically at the wounds and tell us what tools are consistent with the markings that she saw. On Bart Halderson, his fourth cervical vertebrae is consistent with the broken handsaw. That's the tool that Chandler used to cut off his dad's head. And of course, that handsaw or that blade has DNA parts. Tools used to dismember Bart Halderson, the right humerus, consistent with that all-way super saw, right femur, consistent with the all-way super saw, and left femur, consistent with the all-way super saw. That's that saw. Again, has Bart's DNA and blood. Analyst McMahon from the Wisconsin State Crime Lab also looked at some of these items found on the Irwin Road farm. She looked at that saw blade, and she compared it to the saw handle found in the garage of the Halderson home. And she did what she does. She took some measurements, puts things precisely, and found that they were a match, that those items fit. She put together two puzzle pieces. An item from Irwin Road matched an item in the garage of the Halderson home. She also took a look at the tarp in the garbage can. And there's a couple links back to the house with this garbage can. There's an extra lid to a garbage can up in that room that was, I think, at one time a bathroom and that they were remodeling. And there's also a matching sort of container in the garage. Inside of that container found on the farm is a piece of yellow duct tape. That duct tape had blood, that was Bart Halderson's. On that tarp inside of that trash bin, there's more yellow tape, more yellow tape. And there's yellow duct tape found at the house. So analyst McMahon pieced these together microscopically to see if they were a match. And she looked at them and found that they were all one continuous piece of tape. That's the tape he wrapped around the tarp to seal up his dad's torso. There was a, that torso also had Bart and Krista's DNA on it and tested positive for blood. Analyst Matson looked at some various items from the farm as well. She looked at that same tarp and found a fingerprint from Chandler. Now remember that tarp we have Chandler buying at Fleet Farm. It would have been bought and packaged with no fingerprints on it. Here we find it covered in blood with his fingerprint. She also looked at that tarp that was in that bin and looked at it for shoe footwear impression analysis. Could she, she, could, could she see some prints on it and can we match those up to some shoes? Maybe that'll help us figure out who that is, who was on that tarp. She's able to match it up to Brooks Five launch shoes, a pair of Brooks Five launch shoes in a size 10 and a half were found in the Halderson garage. Again, those are the same ones that have blood on them and that Chandler's wearing in that video. A second tarp was found in the barn. It is an older tarp. They tried to do footwear analysis on it, came back to a Ralph Polo sh sh shoe. We never found one of those. But again, that's an older tarp. We don't know if possibly it was before the homicides or after, or if there was a pair of shoes that were ditched somewhere. But that tarp, once again, is covered in blood that tests positive for both Bart and Krista. Now, you saw a picture of Bart working on that tarp. What you didn't see on that tarp was a bunch of blood stains because they weren't there. This blood is from this crime.
Chandler gets home from the farm at 8.54 in the evening after going to the farm and later having dinner with Kat. But that night, he's not done. Early in the morning of the 6th, we see the fireplace burning more. Not as great as before, but some burning. We also see that garage light go on and off, on and off. I think it's a total of seven times, De Deputy Wilk. And that's throughout the night. And we know at 4.30 that morning, Chandler leaves and goes into Madison. We know he goes into Madison from his phone records. We don't know what he did there, but we do know it was a trip that started out in the dark. We know he didn't have a job. And we know Madison's surrounded by lakes. Use your common sense. Wednesday, July 7th. We know the Subaru departs at 936 and that Chandler goes to the farm. We know he goes to the farm from both his phone records, but also from this text exchange with Kat. Kat texts Chandler asking where he's going, and he replies, farm, but no one here, so leaving. We also know that out in the farm was found a Target bag that had been at Chandler's house. How do we know that? Because it has Kat's name on it from the pickup order of the stuff she brought over to Chandler's house, she testified about. That bag is full of bloody rags. We heard from Cress, those aren't from her house, and Catherine, that those aren't her rags. Chandler took a bag full of bloody rags, disposed of it at the farm, and a bag with Cat's name on it. And those tested positive for blood, but were not suitable for DNA testing. He comes back to his house after being at the farm, and he leaves and he goes and reports his parents missing at the police department. So he reports his parents missing. Later that evening, he has a couple visitors. There's close family friends, the Hilkendorfs, and there's two girls that are about the same age as the Halderson brothers, and they go over to try to comfort Chandler, because that's what Krista would want them to do, one of them testified. So that's what they were gonna do. They go over there, and through a series of events, Chandler starts giving them legal advice about police cooperation. You know, you don't have to turn your phone over to police. They don't have to image it. You can just take screenshots and text it to them. Your parents are allegedly missing. You just reported them to the police as missing. And you're encouraging people not to be fully cooperative with police? He then later has pizza that night with Mary Sesto and tells Mary Sesto, she starts saying, well, can't they just ping your parents' phones? Wouldn't that work? And he said, no, they can't ping a cell phone. She, you know, disagrees with him. Yeah, you can. He looked her in the eye, she testified, and coldly said, no, they can't. She was nervous enough of Chandler at that point that she testified that she put herself between the exit door and Chandler. At that point, she knew something had happened. She just didn't have the evidence to back it up yet. It's just her gut feeling. On July 8th, Chandler goes around the neighborhood and questions neighbors concerning video footage. In all fairness, his uncle did recommend that he do this, but his uncle also said it's to preserve that evidence. If you watch those videos and listen to that audio, when people in his neighbor say, yeah, well, I turned it over to the police yesterday, he doesn't say, okay, thank you. He starts asking him questions. Does your camera pick up the road? Does it pick up my house? Does it pick up my driveway? He's not trying to help the investigation. He's trying to figure out, are the police on to me yet? He gives media interviews to three different stations. And as more and more squad cars arrive, he starts calling the police, asking, you know, hey, what's up? Also that day, on July 8th, he does some Google searches. The timing of these searches is incredibly important, folks. Those searches happened at 9.44 and 9.45 a.m. Torso is not found until 3 p.m. 
Krista's legs are not found until a week later. And what is he Googling? Body found, Wisconsin. Women's body found, Wisconsin. Wisconsin dismembered body found. Dead body found, Wisconsin. I think it's interesting what he wasn't Googling. Jane Doe, John Doe in hospital in Wisconsin. Car crashes in northern Wisconsin. Crimes in White Lake, Wisconsin. Drownings on Sawyer Lake, where their cabin is. Or organizations that maybe can help start a manhunt. I think it's also worth noting he had two vehicles available, never even went looking for his parents. There's a reason he knew where they were. He put them there. It's also worth noting that the analyst yesterday, Courtney Ripp, testified that she didn't have any Google searches before July 8th to even look at. So that either means that Chandler never Googled anything for the entire time period of those search warrants, or he cleared his history every day. On this day, he was arrested. He didn't have a chance to clear his history. So he's taken down to the station, where he gives about an hour and a half, two hour interview, where he gives the same lie of this mystery couple of, you know, taking lots of alcohol to the cabin, taking a large amount of cash, because, you know, accountants love to keep large amounts of cash around. Um, and at some point, Detective Hendrickson is like, we know you're lying. We know your parents are no longer here. Why don't you tell us the truth? And at that point, Chandler's arrested. So that's the evidence, folks. That's the pieces of the puzzle in this case. It's not a whodunit. Camera's all around. We know that Bart and Krista went into that home and never came out, at least as whole people. That their bodies were found dismembered, discarded, and hidden throughout the southern half of Wisconsin. That's what the evidence shows. We have experts from DNA, fracture matching, trace, footwear, fire inspector. We have bones in the ash trap. Chandra Halderson killed his parents. But I think it's very important to point out that Bart and Krista Halderson are not a puzzle. So it's a good metaphor, it's a helpful metaphor, perhaps, to look at evidence. But they are two people that were very much alive on June 30th of 2021. They are two people that deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. They were somebody's spouse, somebody's parents, somebody's brother, somebody's sister. They were loved by their neighbors, they had close friends, they had jobs. They were normal folks just trying to live a normal life. They don't even get to be buried next to each other. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm asking that you give justice to Krista and Bart Halderson and that you treat them with the dignity and respect that their own son has never given them. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Raymond. Thank you. Does anybody need a break? Or can we go forward? Actually, Judge, I'm going to ask for a 10 minute break. Okay. Thank I, you. Could, I could use a moment, too. Ladies and gentlemen, we will break, uh, mid morning break, actually, um, and we'll come back for the defense closing and further instructions and perhaps rebuttal arguments. So, Randy? All rise for the jury.